back to the 21 Convention 2017 10-year anniversary live event in Orlando, Florida. Our next speaker is Richard Cooper from Entrepreneurs in Cars. I was talking to him outside before this presentation, figuring out what exactly I wanted to say. And what I concluded was something very simple. The more I talked to this guy in recent months, in recent weeks, in recent days at this event, the more and more happy I am that I had him speak. Every minute I talked to this guy, whether it's on the phone, on Skype, or in the hallway, this is exactly the kind of speaker I want. And you guys, I think, are about to see that red hair right now in Orlando, Florida. Richard, come on stage. All right, guys, what's up? So a um, little bit nervous to talk today, to be honest with you. Uh, apparently, my videos have been in front of about 7 million eyes, and I got about 100 in this room right now, and I'm probably nervous as fuck, so just bear with me. Uh, thanks, Rollo, for introducing me to uh, Anthony to bring me into this convention. And uh, what I hope to deliver to you guys today is a little bit of a life formula, a blueprint on how to live a better life and become a better version of yourself. Um, I'm an entrepreneur, real estate investor, private equity lender, create YouTube videos, uh, written a couple of books in the personal finance space, and I own a company that helps people get out of credit card debt in Canada. So, got a broad spectrum of experience in entrepreneurship. And what I've learned in my life is um, success leaves clues and so do failures. So today's presentation, I'm gonna be giving you my top 10 tips on living a better life based on my experiences and a lot of the men that I've coached. I actually have a coaching business that I built off the YouTube channel. So when people get stuck on stuff in their life as it's related to the channel, they often book my time privately one-on-one -on, -one on the phone. So this is a collection of a lot of my own experiences and people that I've talked to. Warren Buffett, great quote, kind of just uh, encapsulated on that. First thing I want to talk about is letting your wounds become your work. We've all got these stories that we tell ourselves about why we can't be better. I'm not tall enough, I'm too fat, I'm too short, I'm too ugly, I'm too dumb, I'm too broke. Came from this line of work, the color of my skin, the color of my eyes, the color of my hair. These are all buts. They're all some bullshit story that you tell yourself to keep you from becoming better. This is 1974-ish, um, sitting on a beach in England. Mom's Greek, dad was a Royal Air Force sergeant. Unusual thing about this picture, and every picture I can find from about that age to around 15, is I'm always wearing a long sleeve shirt. And you can tell by my arms, I've got third degree burns on both my arms, my neck, and my chest. When I was about a year, year and a half old, my mom had to take, out of, take off out of the room, and as the kettle was boiling, royal, uh, rolling boil, I pulled it down on myself, and I was in the hospital for about two months. Wasn't supposed to live, they did skin grafts. Um, I don't remember it, so fortunate enough for me, it was just, that's a part of my life that I don't remember, but what I remember is growing up like that. And one of the first things that happened as I was a kid growing up was I had a stutter, really bad stutter. Show of hands in this room, who's growing up with a stutter or a stammer? Anybody else? You know what it's like then. So this quick video here, I just want to share it with you. Hello. How's everybody doing today? We're doing fine, champ. You ready for next week? Ready? Yeah. Uh, I'm ready. <laughs> Damn, I have a lot of money on you, man. Well, uh, you, 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 uh, you. Get you ready to be a rich nigga, you feel me, cause, uh, <laughs> cause, uh, come, uh, next, next week, I, uh, I, I'm knocking somebody the fuck out. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? I understand now. <laughs> it took a while, but I got it. <laughs> so... That's Harlem Nights, one of my favorite movies. Check it out. Hilarious. That was pretty much my life for the first 14, 15 years of my life. I had a really hard time communicating. They put me through language therapy classes. Uh, a lot of it came from insecurities about me, myself, what I thought I looked like, my mind's eye towards the world. That's the first picture I could find in the family photo albums of me um, 
This was actually taken in Florida, not too far away from here, uh, I think when our family went to uh, Disneyland. And you can see a big difference in body language from the left picture to the right picture. If you guys were watching Joe Navarro this morning, he was talking about, you know, the uh, self-medicating hug. I'm doing that to hide my scars. I'm doing this to raise up the size of my right arm, make the bicep look bigger. I was a skinny kid. I was about six foot two at that age, 160 pounds. About five years later, uh, 195 pounds, solid muscle. It took me a bit to figure out what it was, but it was myself holding myself back. It was some bullshit story that I told myself that these scars were preventing me from interacting with people, being social, being around women. I was a virgin until I was 19. Uh, I didn't really kiss a girl until I was about 18. Uh, I remember I was super excited when I was around 16. I went out on a double date with uh, my best friend, his girlfriend, and her friend, and I was super proud about what I did in the back seat of the car. I was like, did you see that? He was like, what? What'd you do back there? I was holding her hand. <laughs> I didn't have a lot of confidence. I didn't have a lot going on. I didn't know about my own strength, my own capacity, my own ability to become a better version of myself. I really worked on my own shit and let go of the stuff that was holding me back, which was skin deep. So the first thing that I transformed was what was under the skin. Pick up heavy shit, put it down. It's not fucking hard. Move more, eat better. Not hard. A lot of people make excuses about that, about their self-care. I'll talk more about that later on. Turns out every like 20 odd year old needs a Rottweiler and a dumbbell and some shitty furniture, but, oh, and probably an entire bucket of baby oil, whatever I put on myself there. But I at least had the confidence to sit open, chest open, back wide, shoulders apart. I had confidence. And it was a shift in mindset when my parents took me to the Six Kids uh, Hospital in Toronto. Uh, they took me into the surgeon to do reconst reconstructive surgery or to do a consultation for it. And the surgeon went through what it would take to fix the scars, redo them, try to make you look normal and all that bullshit. And I walked out of thinking to myself, well, the juice isn't worth the squeeze. The results don't seem guaranteed. Sounds like there's going to be a shitload of pain. I don't remember the actual accident, so it doesn't really bother me. Huh. How about if I just accept that this is who I am? And I can change what's under the skin. I can make myself a stronger version of myself. I can pick up weights and modify my body. That's what I did. And then I came to realize that scars are just proof that you're stronger than what tried to kill you. Some powerful shit. Whatever's holding you back right now, I know everybody's in this room for their own reasons, but there's people in this room that want to resolve or reconcile something that's held them back from becoming a better version of themselves, to become stronger, to become an entrepreneur, lose weight, whatever the hell it is. Whatever the fuck that is, it's just some scar. Chicks dig scars. If you know how to process them, you know how to manipulate them, you know how to own them, you, can be, you really can become better. So what I did, uh, this is about two years ago. I wrote this bucket list item to say that I wanted to make a body cast to preserve the scars that held me back in my mind's eye my entire life. So that's a body cast up on the wall. If, does anybody here? Does anybody here? I know a few of you guys watch my videos. Uh, just show of hands who's seen stuff on my channel. Oh, okay, so it's more than two people. Awesome. Um, that's on the wall in my home office. Some people comment in the, the comments, like, hey, why do you have that you know, Roman cast on your wall? Or, the, or it's, it's kind of darkened over the time. So like, why do you have a, a cast of a black man's uh, chest on your wall and sort of thing like that? That's what it is. You can't really see it in the picture, but the way that she did it that day, so that was me before and then as she was covering me up, it captures it in very, very distinct detail. So I'm very proud of having that on my wall. That's why it's there for those of you that have seen the video. Lesson number two. <clears throat> I know a few people have touched on this today, but you have to take 100% ownership for your life. Nobody owes you anything. Nobody's going to give you anything. You're only going to get to where you want to go in life by taking ownership for your shit. The minute you start playing the victim card and blaming somebody else, you might as well sit down, crawl, you know, turn to a ball and cry yourself to sleep. You're a bitch. Nobody cares. The only person that cares about yourself should be you. The only person that's going to make you a better version of yourself will be you. You're the one that makes the choices every day. You need to take ownership for your choices. I could have chosen to, nobody will ever love me, I'll never have women in my life, I'll never make any money, I'll be ugly, broke, whatever, da-da-da-da. I can't 
think of a time in my life when I've been happier than what I am today. I stand before you today at 43, I'll be 44 next month. Divorced, got an eight-year-old daughter, happy as fuck, multiple streams of income. Women come knocking on my door if I want it. It's, it's not hard, right? You can work on whatever you think is holding you back. Pain plus reflection equals growth. Again, nobody owes you shit. Whatever pain points in your life have hurt you, have held you back, sit back, take a deep breath, breathe, and reflect. There's a lesson there. Don't lose in life, learn. Popular video on my channel, sorry about the resolution, it's you're not broken, I spent a lot of time putting this one together. You can go look it up on the channel, I didn't want to play it, but you aren't damaged or broken. Where you sit right now is where you're supposed to be. Whatever delivered you to where you are today, where you need to reconcile whatever shit it is that you need to work on, that's where you're supposed to be. That's your starting point. Okay? You can go up from there. As an adult, you get out of bed, unless you've lost your limbs serving your country and you've got to roll into a wheelchair, everybody in this room gets out of bed the same way. You roll out of it. You get up out of it. Stand up out of it. You start your day the exact same way. You don't get to play the victim card as a fucking adult, okay? All those bitches out there that cry about, oh, politics, job, my hair, I'm bald, whatever the hell it is. You don't get to play the victim card. You're in charge of your life. I don't have any sympathy. You're the one that's driving your life. You're the one that's gonna get the results that you want if you make the changes in your life to get what you want. You gotta do the work. Nothing's gonna come to you. Lesson number three that I've learned in my life is listening to your intuition. This is something that I've sucked at for a good deal in my life. I've gotten into relationships with the wrong type of women. I've made bad business decisions. I've invested poorly. Uh, if I could write a book about my life a couple of years ago, I'd probably title it The Biggest Loser. I've made a shit ton of mistakes. I've learned from a lot of them, and I've learned from other people's mistakes. But your intuition speaks to you. A lot of people think that it's kind of like in the realm of a little voice on your shoulder. And I've talked about this in some of my videos before where it's like, if you're thinking about something and you feel this sensation or this voice, this little voice that says to you, you sure you want to do that? Is that, where the, is that going to get you to where you want to go? That's usually your intuition talking to you. And you don't usually hear it until that little voice becomes a shout. Often when it becomes a shout, that's when the shit gets expensive. Emotionally, physically, economically. Depends on what level it is, but that's when the shit gets expensive. If you listen to your intuition a lot more, it comes from beneath the neck. We tend to over-rationalize stuff in our head as men. I can solve it, I'll get into this relationship and I can work shit out. Whatever it is that's going on in your head and you think that you can over-rationalize and fix it, your, your heart and your gut often knows the path. It'll tell you the way, if, if you choose to listen to it. Most men, especially a lot of the guys that I talk to on my coaching platform, when I'm helping them navigate something that they're stuck on, they're completely unaware of things that are just sitting in their blind spots. We all know what blind spots are if you've ever ridden a motorcycle or driven a car. You know, it's that little area behind where the mirror is in your rearview mirror, and there's stuff sitting in there. And often it's, it's, it's obvious to other people, but not to ourselves. If you open to it and you subscribe to your intuition, it, it will speak to you. So this is an example of a, um, a call that I did based on real estate investing. I put this video on my channel. You can look it up. Titles, real estate investing won't always make you money. I lost $56,000 on this deal. Um, put something together for a guy to bail him out of some debt and uh, fucked me over pretty bad. Uh, cost me a lot, co cost me some lost sleep. This was about two years ago. And the guy even stole the kitchen sink out of the house. He cleaned out the whole fucking house. All the appliances, range hoods, everything took everything, even if it was bolted down, that he could sell online privately. Desperate people do de desperate shit. And if you don't listen to your intuition, mine was talking to me at this time. It said, do you really want to do this deal? This doesn't look like a good deal. And I passed on it because of money, because I thought that I could profit from it or that I could solve it. That's just a picture of the backyard as I was filming. Entire pool was filled with leaves. It cost me like a thousand bucks to have somebody come over and, and, and clean them all out and close down the pool properly before I could sell it under power of sale. But I was basically paying for three mortgages there before I could sell it and get off my hands, and I took a big loss on it. Good decisions come from experience, and experience comes from bad decisions. 
I know somebody else talked about that in an earlier slide, so I'll skip ahead on that. Number four, this is, this is really interesting because I've always been plugged in almost my entire life, very blue-pilled, alpha, but very blue-pilled. And it wasn't until about a year ago because I was still dealing with a shitty breakup. I was dating a single mom with a couple kids for about three years, and there was a lingering sensation after it that consumed a lot of my energy, a lot of my resources. I was away at an entrepreneur's event uh, retreat, and I was talking to a guy about some personal shit. We were banging back and forth about life and women and stuff, and he said, uh, have you read The Rational Male by Rolo Tomasi? And I said, no. He goes, you have to grab that and consume it, and I downloaded it and listened to the Audible. That was around December of last year. So it's been less than a year that I've taken the red pill. And I was having a conversation with a guy that's a men's rights activist. And I don't necessarily subscribe to their notion of how they navigate the world, you know, hold up signs and uh, protests and stuff like that. Um, a lot of other guys have hit on the feminization and the pussification of Western society. And I think uh, if those of you in here that have watched my channel have seen that video, I got one that's, that's good on that too. But I truly believe that if you want to be happy, healthy, and navigate properly through the world as a man, you've got to do it with a red pill lens. Otherwise, you'll be confused as fuck. Things are going to happen that are going to eat up your time and resources that'll be exhausting, that will drain you. The book opens with, why do my eyes hurt? You've never used them before. It's profound shit. Read the book if you haven't. Lesson number five. Constantly update your belief system. I don't change my mind in my life when it comes to things. I update my belief system, okay? Good friend of mine, Colin Collard, did this presentation for my entrepreneurs group. I'll get more into that in a moment. Uh, but this is a slide that he put up for us. Not even a slide, it was a piece of paper that he put up. Is this thing working? Doesn't matter. Um, this is supposed to be an iceberg, waterline, beliefs, attitude, willingness, which is basically the choices that you make every day. And these are your results that you get out of life. So when you update your belief system, it comes from inside, it comes from your core values, it comes from what you believe, which will dictate the choices that you make every day. Should I drink water or Coke? Simple choice. When I go to the grocery store and I fill my buggy or my shopping cart up with my groceries, there's always a distinct correlation between what's in the shopping cart and what that person looks like physically. 100% of the time, you can't get away from it. And if you update your belief system to believe that water is the choice instead of Pepsi, Coke, 7-Up, or whatever the fuck it is that they're drinking, it's a simple way to start having a better life. Make better choices by updating your belief system, you'll get better results. One thing that you can do if you want to size somebody up is take a look at the results they get in their life. I think um, Christian was talking about entrepreneurs and these bullshit guys online that sell these products and services. And if you actually take a look at the results they get out of life, the real results, then you'll know what choices they make every day and what their belief system is. And all you have to do to get better results is make better choices. And to make better choices, you improve your belief system. It's as simple as that. It's not that hard. It's an easy formula for success. I followed it. It's not hard. Lesson number six, circle of influence. Um, you guys have all heard you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with before. It's a fairly you know, common phrase if you haven't. Basically, if you spend time with five dumb asses, you'll be the six. You spend time with five stoners, you'll be the six. You spend time with whatever, you know. You're going to average yourself out. So you have to be intentional about the rooms that you place yourself in. Um, this is my EO forum. EO stands for Entrepreneurs Organization. It's an organization that's around the world. There's some business owners in here. I bet there's probably one or two that are familiar with it. But this is a picture that we took after climbing. A, um, it was during a retreat in Las Vegas. I think it's Red Rock Canyon is what it's called. And all these guys are either in seven or eight figure businesses. Um, one of my best friends here sold a company for multiple figures, largest nonprofit, big leasing company, uh, consulting business, retailer. That's me on the end. You can't help but to become a better version of yourself if you're with better people. It's just going to happen by osmosis. You know, my dad always used to say, you know, birds of a feather flock together, right? If you're intentional about where you go and the time you spend with people and who you choose to spend time with and people that you refuse to spend time with, your life will improve. It's, you know, it's about making these better choices. Coming from a belief system that tells me, be intentional about the people that I spend time with, I'm going to make better choices, which means I'm going to get better results out of my life. 
So be intentional about stuff like that. Be aware of it. If you find yourself in a room where you feel like energy is draining from your system, those people are energy vampires. If you spend an hour in a room or at a dinner party and you feel exhausted out of it because they're talking about meaningless bullshit. Let me give you a really good example. I had a dinner party with a girlfriend once and there were people in the room that I just did not want to spend time with, ex-girlfriend, that I just did not ever want to spend time with again. And she wanted to reorganize another dinner party. And I said, I'm not going. I don't want to do it. Well, why not? She got pissed off, upset as fuck. Oh, these are good people, and why can't you just do it? And all this sort of stuff. It's like, I felt exhausted after being in that room. All she did was browbeat her husband, run her kids into the ground, and talk shit about people. And I'm not going to put myself in that room again, and I'm certainly not going to put my daughter in that room again. It's as simple as that. You make those choices. And you know what? There's going to be people in your life that will come and go. Let them go. It's okay. What got you to where you are today is not necessarily going to get you to where you want to go. If you want to become a better version of yourself, you have to find yourself in a room where you're not the smartest person in the room. The moment you find yourself in a room where you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. You need to get out of that room. Lesson number seven. You only have so many fucks to give, so manage them wisely. I'm going to say some swear words now. Everybody's played a video game. There's a lot of guys in this room. So everybody's played a video game at some point where you have an energy bar, and it's like zero up to 100%. And you get a roundhouse and a solar plexus hit and this hit and a drop kick and the energy bar drops down. It's very similar in life, okay? You only have so many fucks to give in your day and you can only give those fucks to things that are truly fuckworthy. As soon as you start giving fucks to things that are unfuckworthy, you're going to drain your energy. It's as simple as that. Pick up my kid from school, extracurriculars, feed her dinner, load up the dishwasher, take her... Da, 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 da. These are the things that eat up the energy of my day. And I can choose where I want to spend my time and where I want to allocate my fucks. So allocate your time, resources, and energy to things that truly matter. I met a monk once at an Entrepreneur's Org event. He came in as a speaker, spent 10 years in Hawaii, a very good friend of mine now. His name's Don Dapani. And one of the things, one of the lessons that I took away from that event was your energy is going to flow to where your awareness goes. The way they train these monks is awareness is like a ball of light in their mind, and it'll light up different parts, love, sex, desire, business, money, TV show, Netflix binge, whatever the hell it is. That ball of light lights up that area, and you focus on it, and that takes energy. And you have a choice to do that or not do that. It's entirely within your power. The problem is, is most guys, and I notice a lot with this with my coaching clients when I talk to them over the phone on Clarity, they're, they're walking through life sleepwalking, and they're letting Stanley the power drill doing a lot of their thinking for them. Their dick drives a lot of their decisions. And if you take that out of the equation, you'll find that you'll make better, better choices, especially when you allocate your energy to the appropriate places. I love this picture. This guy gives zero fucks. Flips the car, finds his way out of the car to take a picture of his wife stuck in the car and pull his pants up really high. That is a definition of zero fucks. Lesson number eight. This is an area of my life that I've sucked at for my, almost my entire life, up until the last few years. You have to learn how to vet women better. I've had about 100 coaching calls on Clarity, and probably 90 of them have had to do with guys making dumb choices with women. Really bad choices with women. There's nothing, gentlemen, that will fuck up your life better than choosing to partner with the wrong woman. You guys are all familiar with divorce law and how that handles men on the back end. I don't need to go into it. Avoid long-term relationships with. This is my list. I mean, there's probably a few more, but this is my main list, LTRs. I'm not saying don't date them. I'm just saying avoid long-term relationships at all costs with these types of women. Da dangerous personalities. I was actually hoping Joe Navarro was going to talk more about that in his talk, but he wrote a book called Dangerous Personalities. I encourage you to get it. It'll help you filter through the riffraff and pick out higher quality women a lot faster when you spot personality traits like heavy narcissism, uh, instabilities, psychopaths, things like that. If you want to talk about psychopaths, have a chat with Anthony after about uh, Medusa. He'll, he'll, feel, he'll fill you right in. Stay away from women that have dangerous personalities. They will ruin your fucking life. Playing Captain save -a fairly straightforward. Women with daddy issues. If you're a strong, virtuous alpha male and you're dating a woman with daddy issues, she's not going to value you. She didn't have a man in her life when she was growing up. 
And yes, I understand it's not always necessarily her fault, but if the mom had any level of cohesion to, able, to be able to navigate the world properly, grandfather would be in, uncle would be in, somebody would be in. But there's, but there's a lot of women that have gone through most of their life without a strong, virtuous, adult male role model. And if you want to become the best version of yourself, stay away from women like that. They will exhaust the fuck out of you. Broke women, straightforward. You're going to be bailing them out all the time. Birth order conflicts is not something I hear a lot of people talk about. Uh, Dr. Kevin Lehman, just jot this down. He wrote some really good books on birth order. I'd encourage you to pick them up. I'm not going to go into too much detail. I'm a firstborn. I got two younger brothers. For me, being in a long-term relationship with a woman that's also a firstborn is a nightmare. It's like you're always fighting over the steering wheel. Who's going to go where? You know, who's, who's, who's driving the bus? I don't have time for it. For me, the best relationships that I've had have always been with lastborns. So firstborn, lastborn, tender works best. Middleborn can go with either. If there's a age gap of more than five years between the lastborn and the next child, the, the lastborn child then takes on the firstborn personality. So grab that book. You'll find it quite useful. Uh, again, the author's name is Dr. Kevin Lehman. Drug and alcohol dependency is pretty straightforward. Controlling jealous. Had this girlfriend in my 20s, uh, living girlfriend, made the mistake of moving in a woman. Uh, Rolo will talk about that anytime you ask him, but you never live with a woman uh, unless you're marrying her or you're getting married. And uh, jealous as fuck. She, I don't know what her strategy or plan was, but she went, you know, rifling through some of my boxes and belongings that I just stashed away in the back of my closet. And one day I came home from work and confronted, like right in my face, what's up with the Kelly Shrine in your closet at the back of the closet? And I'm like, what are you talking about? I understand. It's like, rifled off all this stuff. And I'm like, oh man, you got to go. Stay away from women like that. They're going to exhaust the crap out of you. If they're jealous or controlling, let somebody else deal with that nonsense. Be intentional about moving through your life. Be intentional about letting people into your life. The more intentional you are, you're going to let people go. There's going to be people that are going to leave your life. Friends that might have been in your life for a long time. Somebody that you might be dating right now. I don't know. It's okay to let them go. Single mothers. I'm going to hit on single mothers for a bit because um, not a lot of people talk about it. I came out of a three-year relationship with a single mother the last couple of years. Uh, this, is a, this is a meme that somebody sent me that I kind of chuckled at, but I'm not going to read it off. You can see it there for yourself. I'll leave it up for a sec. But there's, but there's truth in every joke. Okay? <laughs> when you see these stand-up comics up on stage telling their jokes, the reason why they're funny is because there's elements of truth in them. Okay? So when you see stuff like that, you've got to think about it. The thing about single moms is, you're going to end up with double, triple, quadruple the heartbreak. Um, this ex of mine had a couple boys, and when you spend time playing Halo with little Timmy and zeroing the scope in on the BB gun of Billy, uh, and you take trips and you do the blended family stuff, when she goes, they go too. You'll never see them again. And even though they might have driven you absolutely nuts, you have like double or triple the heartbreak when you deal with somebody like that. Uh, it's also very easy for them to end the relationship because I've done it once. At my age, I was dating mostly divorced women. Seven, out of, seven or eight out of ten women uh, are divorced because they initiate the divorces, so it's very easy for them to move along and just you know, slide into the next relationship. They have questionable judgment skills. Um, you talk to single moms that have been divorced, you'll hear all kinds of stories from them about why they got married, the children, why they made all these decisions and choices, and after a while, you'll start to ask yourself, that's pretty questionable, and I don't see you taking a lot of ownership on whatever it was that you contributed to that. You'll never be a priority. You'll come in behind the kids, the cat, the dog, the extracurriculars, the parent-student nights. You're like fifth or sixth. You know, the tree that needs to get removed in the backyard sort of thing. You're not going to be a priority. You know, save yourself for somebody else that has the capacity of the time. They think the world is going to revolve around her and her kids. She's emotionally unavailable. I talked about the amount of fucks that you have in your day to give to things that are truly fuckworthy. Well, single moms have kids. Uh, they're going to take up a lot of their time and resources. Most single moms have custody of their children more than the men. Okay? So they're going to have to deal with a lot of parenting issues. Uh, mothers tend to dote over their children more than men do. Men are kind of more of like, let me teach you how to deal with this sort of thing. And mothers are like, are you okay? You know, are you shitting properly? Are you eating well? Da -da 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 -da, and all this sort of stuff. I'm, you know, I'm in my 40s. My mom still mothers me. It, you know, they eat up a lot of time and resources. You can even ask married men in this room what it's like to be married, and you'll start to recognize after a while that a lot of energy and resources, even in married couples where they have the children together, is eaten up you know, with the mother spending time with the kids. They're not yours. 
uh, emotionally unavailable, her kids will work against you. Um, they're not intentionally trying to do this, but even your presence in that relationship, you're pissing on the flame of reconciliation between the two parents, whether they choose to acknowledge it or not. Okay? Even if you're a stand-up virtuous guy, you can bend over backwards and do everything under the sun for them. You're still, your presence is still pissing on the flame of reconciliation the way they see it, depending on what their age is, especially if they're younger. They have a distorted self-image. Um, all you have to do is go on any dating app, see single moms in there, they think they're a 10 when they're like a six. You know, everybody's had that experience, I'm sure. They don't take a lot of ownership for the mistakes that happen in their life. And it's 100% investment with 0% ROI. At least with my own daughter, what I invest in her, I get something back. I'm, in, I'm invested in my own lineage, okay? You don't get anything back investing in some other man's children. Lesson number nine. Make self-care a lifestyle choice because it fucking matters. It's a picture from a few months ago. Again, I'm 43. Pick up heavy shit, put it down, be intentional about the sort of stuff that you're gonna be putting in your body, rest properly. I don't know about you guys, but how many of you get an extra body halfway through your life, right? It's the only one you get. So why are you treating it like shit? Why would you put crappy fuel in a nice car, right? You do that to a nice car, it's gonna fall apart and break down. It happens. Pay attention to self-care, it matters. Uh, there's other people here that are gonna be talking about health and fitness, I think, this weekend, so I'm not gonna hammer on that one too much. Last and final lesson is accepting female nature, and I had a very hard time in my plugged-in years doing this. Very Disneyland, prince, princess, egalitarian, you know, hold hands, sing kumbaya, get married, say I do until kingdom come and blah, blah, blah. And it doesn't really work out like that in the real world. When you take the red pill, you start to recognize that a lot of the shit they've been feeding you through school, religion, parenting, society, socioeconomics, politics, a lot of it is bullshit that panders to their needs, not to yours. So as men, again, for true mental awareness, clarity, and happiness, navigating the world with a lens that's a red pill one, will help, help you out. It'll make things a lot better for you. Accepting female nature is a big thing. Uh, Rolo hammered on hypergamy quite a bit this morning, but here's a really good visual of what that looks like. 80, you know, 80 percent of the bangings happening by 20 percent of the men. It's just fact of life, you know. Even, even like a one out of ten is gonna hammer for the, you know, for the stage up. That's what hypergamy is. I'm not gonna go over that too much. My lawyer, when I was going through my divorce, God bless his soul, such a good guy. Um, guy saved me, big time. Um, one of the conversations that we had was pairing up, pair bonding with women. Now, granted he's been in family law for a long time, uh, through my own, my own experiences and those of the guys that I've coached, I discourage you from marrying down. Everybody does it. You know, you're going along in life, here's the entrepreneur, here's the hairdresser. You guys meet up, I love you, she moves in your life, you get married, her lifestyle improves. Yours doesn't change, it doesn't go down, it doesn't go up, it, you know, it is where it is. If you go up, you go up together. Things go sideways, there's a hard break. Then there's a questionable dot, dot, dot. The way family law works and the way hypergamy works, it's designed to maintain her lifestyle at that level. She's not gonna go back down over here. You're often responsible for maintaining that, depending on how long you live together, if you have kids, where you live in the world, what family law says. And you can avoid a lot of that, this is my lawyer's best advice, by not marrying down. There's a lot of women out there, if you choose to get in a long-term relationship to reproduce, settle down, have kids, do it with somebody at your level or higher. At your level, at minimum, or not too far below that. If you do that, you're gonna avoid a considerable amount of problems if things don't work out. Women reserve the right to change their mind at any given time, and men are the disposable sex. Um, Dr. Warren Farrell wrote a book called The Myth of Male Power. You might want to jot that down if you want some good read. Uh, guy was a feminist, was promoting female uh, belief systems for a long time, and he started to recognize that men are not the stronger sex. Men are the weaker sex. Men are disposable. You can dive into that if you want to learn about the di differences between masculinity and femininity from that perspective. Uh, Brefolt's Law and Relationship Equity. Um, Brefolt's Law maintains that the female, not the male, determines the conditions of the animal family. Where the female can derive no benefit from a relationship with a male, no such relationship takes place. Even if a woman has accrued past benefits from her man, there's no guarantee of her continuing the re relationship with him. 
That's why when you meet these divorced moms and they tell you these stories about how they got bored or how things didn't work out or whatever narrative they're going to tell you about why they left the marriage, he could have been an excellent provider up to some point where he no longer served a purpose for her. She had the kids. They're at a certain age where she felt comfortable with ending it. Heartbreak, relationship's over. It is a law of the world, of the animal kingdom. Make no mistake, guys, you're all animals too. We just figured out how to build roads, turn on lights, and do shit like this and, you know, point stuff. We're all monkeys. We're all primates, okay? There's no difference. This is consistent throughout the animal kingdom. Unicorns don't exist. This is a funny comment I screen captured. I'll read it to you if you can't read it. The video was uh, Five Secrets Women Don't Want You to Know. And this guy says, I'm so glad I found a unicorn. No social media. Makes way more money than I do. Never asked me to give up my way of being. Just bought me a brand new truck in cash. Blah, blah, blah. To which I respond two things. Hypergamy doesn't care. Women always reserve the right to change their mind at any given time. Enjoy it. You don't own this unicorn. It's just your turn. <laughs> Unicorns do not exist. You might think they exist. And even if you capture one, it's just your turn. Often these things don't last. Last thing I want to hit on, because I want to do some Q&A before the end of it, because that's where I really prefer to spend my time, is, is coaching people and answering questions. Uh, human promiscuity. Anybody read Sex at Dawn? Show of hands. Handful. Awesome book. Read it. Okay? If you've ever been confused about the way men behave versus the way women behave in society, if I take my hands like this, millions of years of human evolution, pluck a beard here because I don't have hair on my head, and put that right at the end, that's the last 10,000 years how we've been functioning under the function of monogamy okay? in society the way that we live today. We've been programmed to live this way a hell of a lot longer than we have in the society that we live today. Men are designed to scatter seeds, which is why we want to pork everything. Women are designed to seek provisioning and safety. The depth in which they go into the explanation of human behavior, unreal. I'll let you guys take a look at that. So I'll wrap it up at that. Social links if you want to find me on Entrepreneurs in Cars on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook. Uh, I also do coaching on clarity.fm forward slash Richard Cooper if you ever want to hop on a call and deep dive into something you're stuck on. I'll open the floor up to questions. Or Max, if you just want to pass around the mic to whoever you can get it to. Go ahead, yeah. There's no such thing as an ironclad prenup. Uh, prenups lose their value over time. So unless you have a family lawyer and she's willing to renew the aspects of the prenup together uh, without you know, coercion or whatever, they don't have a lot of value. Like They start to run out of value over time. Um, the intent's good. It sets intent. But prenups get thrown out of court all the time. Go ahead. You know, Max, you just pick them out. You got the mic. I like fast cars. I've got a garage full of 1,300 horsepower. I like, I like fast German cars. It's my thing. I'm not here to talk about cars today. If you want to shoot the shit afterwards, let's do that. I'm a little bit older than you, and I'm divorced. You mentioned about dating again, uh, getting involved with another woman. Most of the women m my age or a little younger already have kids, whether they're grown or not. Uh, what is your recommendation on uh, guys your age Got and, and older? Yeah, so I'm, I'm still vehemently opposed to getting into an LTR with a single mom. If she's got a kid or kids, like for example, I've got a daughter, she's eight. If she's got a daughter that's eight, lives in the same school zone, is not batshit crazy, and I can date her, like she doesn't violate any of the non-negotiables, I'd consider it. But as you mentioned, the older you get, there's fewer women without children. You know, women that have children that have moved out, uh, you know, not so bad. Uh, but if there's a discrepancy, um, like one of the things I was talking to a guy once on a coaching call, which I've shared in my videos before, is I've got a daughter. And between um, opposite sex children, 
pheromone repellents exist. That's why you know brothers and sisters don't usually have sex or make advances to each other. But the moment you've got a child in your house that's not of the same bloodline, and you've got a daughter, you could potentially violate her. You know, you could expose her to a lot of risk. So I'm fully aware of that, and I'm never going to let that shit happen. So moms, single moms, unless they've got a kid that's the same age as my daughter, same sex, I wouldn't even consider it. Date them. Thanks, Richard. Great, great presentation. Um, you've built a very, very successful life for yourself. And one slide showed that you said, but you can truly be happy if you red pill aware. And your red pill awareness started just short of a year ago, right? right. So y most of your life you've read basically within the blue pill conditioning. Plugged in. So when you compare both lives, what do you see like this red pill awareness in the last year? What, m how did it make you, impacted you? And where do you see the difference and how the, you know, the happiness, where, where do you see the Got biggest it. gains? Okay, yeah, so um, I talked about updating your belief system to make better choices to get the results that you want. When you become red pill aware, you view conversations, women, business opportunities, everything through a red pill lens. And then that way you're making choices that are gonna be congruent with the results that you wanna get. So that's essentially how it works, right? And you find yourself saying no a lot. You say no to a lot of women. You know, a lot of women want to get into my life and plug into my life, and it's like, nope, I'm good. As soon as, you know, as soon as you see what the truth is and where it lies, it, you know, it's okay to pass. And you're going to be judged, you're going to be criticized, you're going to be called names, you're going to be told to man up and blah, 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 fill in, you know, the narrative. It doesn't matter, it doesn't bother me. Uh, Richard, great speech. Thank you. Um, was curious as to your red pill awareness and how it's changed how you interact with your daughter and how you interact with her mother. Got it. Um, I'd say it's improved my relationship with my daughter. Um, same thing with her mom. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, you don't let stuff bother you. There's things in my past a couple of years ago that would just drain the crap out of me. I wouldn't be able to sleep at night because of a conversation that happened or something that would just tax me. And when you navigate with red pill awareness, you're just like, ah, it's par for the course. We're cool. Move on to the next thing. For me anyway, like I find that it doesn't weigh me down. Uh, you'd mentioned about updating your, your belief system and also about sort of following your intuitions. Uh, and I, sometimes I find that I can update my belief systems logically, but my, my intuitions or my, my feelings and my emotions lag behind. And I wonder if you had any uh, your, suggestions yeah. for how to, how to you know, Got update. It. So the, your emotions are different from your intuition. Very different. Your emotions are what you feel. Your intuition guides you. It's a different thing completely. Do you mind covering the bad decision process again where you get experiences from bad decisions and basically learn yeah. from it and then how to minimize risk when well, making yeah. decisions or when you make bad decisions? Yeah, well, I think you know when you make a bad choice because you get a shitty result, right? You know, I can get the hungry man dinner and a case of pop and drink that for a week and eat out at McDonald's and feel like crap after about a week. I mean. If you've seen any of those movies around, like Super Size Me, you know, for example, you see the amount of sodium and sugar and preservatives and all that stuff and how it changes your body, the way you think, brain fog and all that sort of stuff. You should just open up your eyes and pay attention. You know, when, you, when you're red pill aware, I think that you just pay attention to things a lot more rather than sleepwalk through life and just go through the motion of you know, what you've always been doing. I mean, if you keep doing what you've always done, you're going to get the same shit. Right? You have to change what you're doing to get a different result. Like I said earlier, what got you to where you are today is not going to get you to where you want to go, especially if it's higher up. You're going to have to change your circle of influence. You're going to have to change your choices through your belief system to get results that are going to get you up here. Does that make sense? First of all, thanks, Richard. Um, I think probably most of us are here because we want to be better men, better people, better protected, be more awesome, all those kinds of things, and I applaud all of you for being here. 
but I think that's something that I think would be great for you to comment on is how having an red pill alpha male in your daughter's life will improve you know, for both having young men having, uh, or young boys having an alpha male father role, as well as your daughter having an alpha male in her life will improve their lives going forward. Well, I think that little girls um, model the man that they want to be with later on in their life. Um, I can't speak from experience because she's only eight and I haven't seen her completely grow up yet. Um, but uh, boys, I don't have a son, so I can't really comment on it. But there's, there's a lot of feminized men out there today that grew up in single mother households, absent fathers, um, you know, browbeaten fathers. I call them uh, plow horses. Um, you know, you can go to the grocery store and you'll see them pushing the buggy filled with, you know, diapers, baby food, you know, fucking cheese strings, crap food, three screaming kids and the wife yelling at him, you know, banging on his head sort of thing. That's a plow horse, right? And you have a choice how you want to live your life and where you want to go and how you want to do things. So, um, you know, the, those types of environments breed more beta plow horses that will grow up and do the same feminized thing. I mean, the great thing about being in this room today is you guys are exposed to elite material, elite content that most guys don't get. Most guys are walking around through life, sleepwalking, not knowing what they're, they're doing. So you've got a distinct advantage in life if you consume this and you use it. Hi, Richard. Um, I perceived your perception that your step in taking kind of like ownership of what happened to you with the burning and stuff, I sense that that's part of your masculine journey is my sense. Um, and I think everybody in this room probably is going to have their own journey, whether you think it's going to lean towards that aspect of their lives or not. For me, I think it's very important. Um, is there any other markers of your life that you think also helped you develop more of this core belief about your masculinity and why you know why those steps have made a big impact in you developing that Cause, but i think that for me just seeing you kind of absorb that experience of having burned being burned is pretty amazing because i think we all have our own traumas and how we want to inherit that is our choice you yeah. know yeah um, so if I understand your question, you're talking about how you develop the masculinity? I mean, is there any other milestones that you felt like it happened in your life or you absorbed it and became part of your belief about yeah. you know, masculinity? I think, I, I think probably one of the biggest things that changed my life was a class in high school called aerobics and weight training. And, you know, it's, as it's described, pick up heavy shit, put it down, strengthen your body. Um, if you strengthen your body, you can't help but to strengthen your mind. You know, you got to tow those things in sequence. It's very hard to do one without the other um, because it takes a lot of discipline to build a strong body. It takes a lot of discipline. You know, there's not a lot of people that can do it. So when you've got the discipline in your head, you're of course going to have that that you can plug into other areas of your life. So um, that was an early stage for me. You know, like that, 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 you know, I showed you the picture earlier when I was about 16 years old and then like five years later, 21, uh, 40 pounds of muscle covered in baby oil like an idiot. But, you know, that sort of stuff, it, like, it, like it makes a difference. I mean, when you get out of the shower and you look at yourself in the mirror, you're like, fuck, I look like a superhuman, you know? It, like, it, it's gonna affect the way that you live. You can't help but let it affect the way that you live in a better way. Does that make sense? I actually got a question for you myself. Yeah, man. It's on. So you mentioned that we have a limited amount of fucks to give and that we should use them wisely. And I personally, at least used to be quite anxious. And I would give a fuck about little things all throughout the day, which would pretty much make my day the opposite of Zen. You know, I'd be like constantly just monkey mind all over the place. So my question to you is, when is it worth giving a fuck? What's the things that we have to give a fuck about throughout the day? So if you value your fucks as a resource, you're only gonna allocate your fucks to things that are truly fuck worthy. We're about out of time. Richard, thank you very much. Okay. Thanks, guys.